questions. Start with what is enlightenment? In the world we hear about, you know, the enlightenment, you know, a time in the 18th century, we hear about different ages of enlightenment. And all of them have a common theme. It's, uh, it's a celebration of man, man's scientific knowledge, and man's logic that produces more enlightenment than tradition or religion. Those are the common themes. Um, today you even hear like uh, what I'd call popular enlightenment, right? Like uh, popular knowledge, like what's, what's, what is popular to know? You know, you're in the know. What's popular politics, popular people, popular phrases, taglines, uh, popular lifestyles? You know, uh, all those you're considered enlightened in this popular group. But I think we should start by asking, what exactly is it that's in that, that popular group, the, cl- the group that's in the know? That, what is it that they, they claim to know? Um, what is their certainty? What exact knowledge has enlightened them? Like, where did they get this knowledge? And uh, is many or popular synonymous with truth? And these are rhetorical questions, right? And does popular make it true? Do you believe something just because it's popular? Of course, everybody in this room would say with a resounding no, absolutely not. So let's get into the word um, enlightenment. Let's break it down. Let's start with enlighten. And the most obvious part of enlight or enlighten, let me just draw it up here real quick. It's a bad end. We'll make it like this. What jumps out at you when you see it? Light. That's right. And that's where enlightenment comes from. And that's where enlightenment comes from. So let's go over. Uh, I like this Webster's uh, 1828 definition. Enlightened means to make light. So let's define light real quick. Something that makes vision possible. Okay, Karen said darkness is simply the absence of light, right? We've heard that before. And zero light makes vision impossible. And I'll just tell you a quick story. In the, uh, in the Marine Corps, we do night operations, and we do uh, patrols. And we relied on what's called night vision goggles. And night vision goggles are great if there's light to be magnified. If light is not present, you can't use night vision goggles. You have to have light for night vision goggles to work. And there might be somebody that's listening to this later or in the room now that's thinking about, well, what about thermals, Josh? Thermals are great. Thermals are absolutely great because you can see in absolute darkness if there's changes in temperature enough that an algorithm can create an image for you to see off of those changes. Those changes in temperature create an image. But here's where thermals break down. Thermals take that image and present it by light in a scope or on a screen or a heads-up display. Man can only see if there's light. We have to have a screen. This device doesn't work well without light, right? Okay. So to enlighten also means to illuminate. Illuminate is an interesting word. To make something to make something clear and easy to understand. I love that. To to illuminate as the sun enlightens the earth. What does the sun do for the earth? It illuminates it. It makes it clearer and easier to understand where we are, what's going on, right? And what's great here is by design in the Word of God, God draws analogies um, to the spiritual from his material creation, right? So he uses natural light to illustrate things in the spiritual, and that's where we're going. So a couple more definitions of enlightened that are, are helpful to enable to see more clearly, to enable to see or comprehend truth, to enlighten the mind or understanding, a knowledge of the truth. These are all definitions of enlighten in 1828. Today, Merriam-Webster says, to give knowledge or understanding to someone, enlighten is a transitive verb, so you have to enlighten something, in this case, someone, right? To explain something to someone. So let's, let's begin with the first illumination ever. So Genesis 1-3. 
Genesis 1-3, we've read this a bunch of times, but let's look at it through the lens of, of enlighten or illumination or enlightenment. So here's the first illuminator. Are you ready? Let there be light, and there was light. And in verse 5, and God called the light day, and darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. So this precedent that the word of God is light is from the beginning. He spoke and light happened. The word of God is light. Let there be light, there was light. First precedent. And this preceded man on day six, right? Why? Because, because mankind needs light to live. That's true in the material, that's true in the spiritual. Psalm 1828. This is where the Lord starts using these words. Psalm 18, verse 28. For thou wilt light my candle, the Lord my God will enlighten my darkness. So here the Lord talks about he is the enlightener. And that's my next question, but we just answered it. Who is the enlightener? So all we're going to do is add ER. Who is the enlightener? Well, we just were told in Psalm 18, it's the Lord God, right? So what is an enlightener? It's one who illuminates, which communicates light to the eye, or clear views to the mind. That's interesting, isn't it? Clear views to the mind. Very important. It's very important to have clear views to the mind, right? And we'll, we'll, we'll see other scriptures where it talks about the eye of man but we'll get there. Psalm 36, 9 is where I'd like to go. Psalm chapter 36, verse 9. It says, For with thee is the fountain of life. In thy light shall we see light. I had to think on this one for quite a while. In thy light shall we see light. And this is one of those, it's not often, um, but every once in a while I'll have to stop and say, Lord, I know you upbraideth not, and you give wisdom to all those that ask, and this is one of those scriptures that I asked for wisdom on. And I thought and thought on it, and it wasn't more than you know, a few seconds. He dropped in, well, who's the light? And it's Jesus Christ. And in Jesus Christ, we can see the light. We'll read John 3, 3 a little bit later, that unless a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. We have to be in Christ to see Psalm 97, verse 4. This is a fun one. Psalm 97, verse 4. I'll wait until everybody gets there because this is a good one. Psalm 97, verse 4. His lightnings, that means flashing sword, enlightened the world. The earth saw and trembled. What a, an appropriate term for God's word, right? A flashing sword, and he compares it in the material to lightning. And if anybody's ever seen a thunderstorm, it's amazing in absolute darkness, as soon as a bolt of lightning occurs, what happens? It's like daytime. You can see everything clearly, just for that split second. And lightning bolts, from what I understand, are no wider than an inch. And from miles and miles away, they can light up the entire sky. His lightnings enlightened the world. It's still true today. Let's go to Bob's favorite chapter. Psalm 119. Psalm 119, verse 130. The entrance of thy words giveth light. So it's the words that give light. Whose words? God's words. The entrance of God's word gives light. It gives understanding to the simple. Proverbs 16.15 Proverbs chapter 16 verse 15 In the light of the king's countenance is life and his favor as a cloud of the latter rain. 
So there's so much packed in this, it's wonderful. In the light of the king's countenance, and who is our king? Jesus, the light himself, right? And his favor is as the cloud of the latter rain. That's beautiful too, because latter rain, the water, synonymous with the word of God. And he uses cloud in several ways, and we're going to focus in on um, Exodus chapter 13, 21. Exodus chapter 13, verse 21. I'm going to talk about another cloud here. And the Lord went before them, the children of Israel, by day in a pillar of a cloud. Why? To lead them in the way. And we know who that way is, John 14, 6, I think. And by night, darkness, in a pillar of fire, to give them light so they could see. And this, of course, is in the natural. To go by day and night, he took not away the pillar of the cloud by day, nor the pillar of fire by night from before the people. And does he take away his word ever from us, day or night? No, it's there. It's still illuminating. Exodus 14, 19. Exodus chapter 14, verse 19. And the angel of God which went before the camp of Israel, removed and went behind them. And the pillar of the cloud went before their face and stood behind them. And it came between the camp of the Egyptians, the world, and the camp of Israel, God's people. And it was a cloud and darkness to them, the world, Egypt, but it gave light by night to these, Israel, the people of God. And it was a cloud and darkness to them, but it gave light by night to these, so that the one came not near the other all the night. It's interesting. What's light to us is darkness to the world. What's, it's just, it's so cool as we keep going. I'll just stop there. Isaiah 9-2. The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them hath the light shined. And this prophecy was fulfilled in Matthew chapter 4, verse 16. It says, the people which sat in darkness saw great light. And that word light there, I'm going to introduce it, means fire, means light, means truth, or the accurate description of reality. And to them which sat in the region and shadow of death, light is sprung up. And from that time that light has sprung up, it says, Jesus said, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Why did he say this right after the light has sprung up? Why did he say repent? John 3.3. 3. Truly, truly, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. That's why. We see light in the light. It's the only way we can see it. And this cannot means, I looked it up, it's an absolute negative. There's no possible way that you can see except you be born again. Proverbs 29, 18. Proverbs chapter 29, verse 18. Where there is no vision, sight, or revelation, the people perish. But he that keepeth the law, the word of God, Happy is he. And I've heard this scripture taken out of context so many times to say that you need to have big goals, lofty goals. You know, we should have a pavement that's as big as Texas, or we should have a parking lot at our church that's as big as Texas, you know, and buildings that reach into the sky. You know, without a vision, the people perish. No, that's not what he's saying. The word vision here is sight. Without sight or revelation, revelation of what? The truth, the people perish. If you walk around in the dark and have no sight, if you go long enough without light, you'll perish. If nothing else, no food will be able to be grown, right? You won't be able to eat anything, find anything, do anything. That's in the material. How much more in the spiritual if you can't see things, if you walk in darkness? Where there is no vision, the people perish. But the Lord gives us vision. He gives us light. John chapter 11, verse 10. John chapter 11, verse 10. But if a man walk in the night, he stumbleth because there is no light in him. There is no light in that man that stumbleth. You could substitute light here with a different word, 
Let's, let's read it this way. He stumbleth because there is no Jesus Christ in him. Light is synonymous with Jesus Christ. He stumbles because he's not born again. He can't see. And when you cannot see, you cannot walk with confidence. If I close my eyes and try to make it across the room, I guarantee I'm not doing it with confidence. I'll be hesitant. I'll be trying to see it in different ways by feeling it, right? You can't walk with confidence. If you can't see in the spiritual, you can't walk by faith. Because faith is full and absolute confidence, isn't it? John chapter 1, 4 through 12. These are the scriptures that really jump out when you think of the word light. We'll pick up in John chapter 1. Let's pick up in verse 4. In him, Jesus Christ, was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light, Jesus Christ, that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. I'm going to pause there. Lighteth, ignite, starts, begins, and also enlightens us naturally by our own conscience, doesn't he? Our own conscience, Wesley said something that's really cool. He said, our own conscience, if left alone and man didn't hinder, would lead us onto that perfect day if we didn't hinder it. He enlightens us just with our conscience, letting us know what we don't know and how we're living according to it. I thought that was a really good insight. So it says here, the light, Jesus Christ, lights every man that comes into the world. And then, sadly, he was in the world and the world was made by him and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But, here's the good news, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, Jesus Christ. So that's who the enlightener is, Jesus Christ, the light. Now, who are the enlightened? And notice that's past tense, right? It means you had to receive something. It means you had to be illuminated. You had to be enlightened. I bet you guys can guess where this is going. Who are the enlightened? That's right. You guys are so good. Enlightened. So Webster's 1828, rendered light, illuminated, instructed, informed, and I love this one. The enlightened are furnished with clear views. Furnished with clear views. In a conversation I had with, uh, with Aaron, I think Brian and Wendy not that long ago, Aaron had mentioned in one of his briefs that he was writing, he used an older term called by their lights, by their lights, or by the illumination of their mind. This is how they saw things, okay? I think that's a, 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 an interesting phrase. It makes a lot more sense now. By the light that you have, that's how you view the world, right? And if you don't have a lot of light, then you probably got a pretty dim view of the world. You don't understand. Maybe you're confused quite a bit. You're ignorant of many things. Spiritual, that is. But if you have a fully illuminated mind, it's like the lights are completely on in the world. You can see everything clearly, what color it is, what's going on, what movement, what's happening. So is with the word of God. I love that he compares it to when the sun's up is the day. And when the sun, Jesus Christ, is up, so is the day for us spiritually. Psalm 97, chapter 97 Verse 11. Let's read that. Who are the enlightened? It says, light is sown for the righteous. Light is for the righteous. And gladness for the upright in heart. And upright, of course, means not fallen. Right? If you stand something upright, it means it isn't fallen. It's that simple. But light is sown for the righteous. Psalm chapter 112 Let's go to verse 4. Psalm chapter 112, verse 4. Unto the upright there ariseth light in darkness. So true, isn't it? Here we are in the midst of darkness, and the Lord continues to give us full illumination. The upright there ariseth light in darkness. He is gracious and full of compassion and righteous. 
And then Psalm 119, 105, we're very familiar with this. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. It's the word of God that illuminates. I can't stress that enough. It's the word of God that illuminates. It's what helps us to see, to see things not material, but to see things spiritual. And we can make sense of the material from that, can't we? We can see why the world does what it does when we understand the spiritual. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 18. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 18. But the path of the just is as a shining light that shineth more and more unto the perfect day. And this was the scripture that John Wesley used to describe if man would just not hinder the conscience. The just is as the shining light that shineth more and more unto that perfect day. He said you'd shine more and more unto that perfect day if you just paid attention to what the Lord was teaching you. And you let the conscience do exactly what it's supposed to do. But the path of the just is a shining light. And it doesn't get dimmer. What does it do? It gets brighter and brighter until that perfect day. Amen. Matthew chapter 5 verse 14. Matthew chapter 5 verse 14. Remember we're in who are the enlightened? Jesus says you. Ye. But that means you are the light, right? You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light. Unto all that are in the house, let your light so shine before men. Why? So that they may see your good works and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. It's pretty cool. If you remember when we first started, right after Genesis, Psalm 1828, he said, For thou wilt light my candle. And then Jesus uses that same term here, right? Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light. We are lights to the world. Luke chapter 11, 33. We're lights to the world because we're enlightened. And if we're enlightened, then we can enlighten others. We can illuminate others. But you can't enlighten anybody. You can't illuminate anybody if you yourself don't possess the fire that gives off light. Which is the word of God. We know that. So Luke chapter 11, 33. Verse 33. No man, when he hath lighted a candle, putteth it in a secret place, neither under a bushel, but on a candlestick, that they which come in may see the light. The light of the body is the eye. Do you remember that? Vision to the eye. The light gives vision to the eye. It says, the light of the body is the eye. What does that mean? I know how we can show this. Right? Probably never seen this before, so get close attention. Okay, so the light of the body is the eye. Vision or pursuit of your mind and your will. Your vision, we sometimes we say on a strategic plan in a, in a corporation or at work or for a business, you know, it's, 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 let's say we're NASA and we want to go to Mars. Mars is the vision, that's our goal. That's the pursuits of our mind and our energy, our will, okay? So it's the pursuits the mind and the will. That's what the eye of man is. What you're looking for, what you're pursuing, right? Now let's continue reading with that understanding. But when thine eye is evil, thy body also is full of darkness. There's no illumination. Take heed therefore that the light which is in thee is not be not darkness. If thy whole body, whole, 100%, if thy whole body be full of light, the word of God, 
having no part dark, no part dark, he even says that, having zero parts dark, the whole shall be full of light, as when the bright, bright shining of a candle doth give thee light. And it's interesting because there's five different words here for light in the Greek that we don't have in English. Five different ones. If thy whole body is also full of light, that light means well illuminated. If you're transparent, you can see through. Light can go through transparent things. That's why we're able to see it. So if you're, if you're transparent or of bright character, that's what that word means in the Greek. I think that's great. That's, I, there's so much just in that little, little verse there. And one other thing I just want to show you here. We've heard the word understanding over and over again, right? What if I said it like this? What is your understand? What, what are you standing on? Okay, that's all, that's all understanding means. What are you standing on? Popular enlightenment stands on the many, the many who accepted whatever it is. That's what they stand on. Jesus would refer to that as sand. Jesus referred to his word as the rock that does not change. That's my understand, Ian, right? That's what I stand on. It's that simple. We speak good here in the free saints. <laughs> Paul uses this term too, enlightened. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 18. And I wish we could get into the context of like every single one of these tidbits of scripture. And I think you should. So here's my plug for the Bible school. So you can, you can read every word in the Bible school. That's my plug. Now we'll move on. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 18. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, the eye of being enlightened that you may know what is the hope of the calling and what is the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints Ephesians chapter 3 verse 9 says and to make all men see how do we make all men see light we give them the truth we illuminate things for them we show them what's in the darkness we show them with the word of God And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 10. But is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to light. How? Through the gospel, through the word of God. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 32. But to call to remembrance the former days in which after you were illuminated, you endured a great fight of afflictions. And how true is that? After we're illuminated, do we fight a great fight of afflictions? Is there an adversary? Yes. But we overcome by continuing in the light and walking in the way. It's cool. The Lord uses enlightened and illuminated and light so much. Romans chapter 13, verse 12. Romans chapter 13, verse 12. It says, The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness, and let us put on the armor of light. I think that's interesting. Lights referred to as armor. Now we know the Ephesians 6 chapter, but this one's great. Because if your whole house is lit, and you have light, whole house, all light, you have an impenetrable fortress. Impenetrable fortress. That's what what you have with the full illumination of the truth. There's no reason why any fiery dart should get in. There's no reason why you should ever allow anything into your mind or your mind to be occupied or pursue anything in darkness with your heart. There's, you're an impenetrable fortress if you're fully illuminated with all of the truth, the word of God. Impenetrable fortress, armor of light. So let's end where we began. What is enlightenment? 
Enlightenment defined. It's the act of giving someone knowledge or understanding. The state of having knowledge or understanding. Including warnings. Okay? Warnings are knowledge. Warnings are understanding. Let's read one. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 14. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 14. And no marvel... So Paul's not amazed here. He's not surprised. You could say, it's not surprising, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Huh. So there's a false enlightener. There's a false illuminator. There's false enlightenment. So let's take a look at an example of counterfeit enlightenment. We don't have to go back there, but you remember Genesis 3, when Satan is first introduced in our recordings in Scripture, right? And did he provide some type of false illumination, false enlightenment? He promised enlightenment, but where did it lead? It led to the curse and us being kicked out of the presence of the Lord and an awful fall of mankind, and we've been reaping the consequences ever since. Satan's enlightenment leads to blindness, to reprobate minds, to strong delusion, to dark hearts. Think about that. Dark hearts. Then, if unrepented of, eternal torment. That's where false enlightenment leads. That's where darkness leads. We want to walk in the light. There's another one in Isaiah chapter 5, verse 20. And this is very relevant. It's been relevant for all time, but very relevant for today. And I hope that mankind listens and heeds. Isaiah chapter 5, verse 20. Woe or cursed unto them that call evil good and good evil that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Cursed. John, chapter 3. Well, let let me say this. No, we'll read it first. I changed my mind. John, chapter 3, verse 19. I found this really interesting because a long time ago I, I, I went through a lot of false condemnation um, and I looked up condemnation to find out what the real condemnation was and this is it. And this is the condemnation, the condemnation that light is come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light. Think about that. You have to walk away from the light to do darkness. You have to walk away from the light to do darkness. So as long as you're walking towards the light, you don't do darkness, do you? Neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. And we've all done that, haven't we? We came to the light and our deeds were reproved. We repented and we've been walking with the Lord. But he... I'm sorry, John chapter 3, verse 19. I apologize. John chapter 3, verse 19 lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light. That's his saints. We go to the light. That his deeds may be manifest, that they are wrought in God. John chapter 8, verse 12. Then Jesus spake again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Men need light to live. John chapter 12, verse 46. I am come a light into the world. Why? Why, Lord Jesus? That whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness. That's not the Lord's goal for you, to abide and stay in darkness. He wants you to be in the light. He wants you to be illuminated, to have illumination, so that you can uh, walk with confidence. Acts chapter 26, verse 18. A restatement of Christ's words. To open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light. This is his whole mission as to why he came. What an awesome mission. There's no better mission than this. There's no better story than this in all of the world. To open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light. That was me. And from the power of Satan unto God. That was me. That they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. So hold up. We don't just get our sins forgiven, but we have an inheritance with the saints eternal. 
speechless, overwhelming. Uh, what wonderful news for mankind. Uh, you talk about good news. News that should take up the airwaves and never stop. This is the good news. You know, you, you pause and you focus all your attention on this and think about it a bit. It's overwhelming. Thank you, Lord. And then 1 John 1, 5. This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him, in the light, is no darkness at all. Verse 7. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. And of course we know his body broken for our physical healing and material need as well. All in all. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 5. Therefore judge nothing before the time until the Lord come, who will bring to light the hidden things of darkness. That's what I just wanted to focus on. He'll bring to light the hidden things of darkness. Everything will be judged accordingly. And how does he come? How does he come? It's very interesting. Luke chapter 17, verse 24. Luke chapter 17, verse 24. For as lightning that lighteneth out of the one part under heaven shineth unto the other part of heaven, so shall also the Son of Man be in his day. His return, he likens it to coming back as lightning and illuminating everything once and for all final judgment. Praise the Lord, though. He gave us even more illumination or revelation. You could use that synonymously, right? Can anybody think of the book of Illumination? Where is that? The last one. The last one. Book of Revelation. Very good. <laughs> Revelation. Chapter 18, verse 1. And after these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. Revelation chapter 21. Verse 23. And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon, to shine in it. For the glory of God did lighten it. And the Lamb is the light thereof. And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it. And the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it. So the light that we reflect from the light keeps everything illuminated. Sounds like a pretty good place. Revelation chapter 22 verse 5. I'll close with this. And there shall be no night there, no darkness there. And they need no candle, neither light of the sun. For the Lord God giveth them light. And they shall reign forever and ever. <laughs>